welcome. My name is Pastor Nate from Active Love Church. So glad you're watching this video this morning. We are in the middle of 1 Corinthians. Today we're going to talk about chapters 12 and 13. Both of those are pretty famous chapters that you might be familiar with. Last week we had a lot of fun talking about women in church, talking about communion, talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit. But really all those things are under the umbrella of doing worship together, and uh, giving preference to one another, loving one another, respecting each other. Today we're going to be talking about the body of Christ and what love looks like in a Christian body. So many of you are probably familiar with the expression body of Christ that comes uh, especially here from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul says, look all of you are a part of this body of Jesus on the earth today. Jesus has ascended but he gave us his Holy Spirit to dwell in us, and he says that collectively we become his hands and feet on this earth, and we get to carry out the commission that we were given by Jesus himself to go and make disciples and baptize people and teach them and, 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 and show them how much God loves them so they can join into this kingdom as well. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is continuing his lesson that the church in Corinth needs to be unified, that they don't, they don't need to be arguing, they don't need to be separating themselves, they don't need to be aligning by factions or cliques, but instead that they need to be unified as the body of Christ that they are called to be. Verse 15 says that we are the hands and feet of Christ. When Christ ascended, he said that the Holy Spirit would come, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and now collectively we get to be his hands and feet. I can remember being on a college campus where an atheist was doing an open air debate and challenging Christians to speak up. And one of the things he said was, who here can say that they've ever seen Jesus? And of course that's a difficult question to answer because we know that Jesus uh, died and re was resurrected and, and ascended into heaven long ago. But yet, he's making his case that, you know, you don't really have anything tangible to put your faith in. And there was a brave Christian there who spoke up and he said, I have seen and touched Jesus. And I applaud this student who is speaking against this much older atheist speaker. Because what he was saying was, look, we are, we are the hands and we are the body of Christ. His spirit is us. And so when we operate in the Spirit, we are operating as Jesus Christ. And when we come into fellowship with one another, when we do that in Christian love, we are able to put our arms around the body of Christ, Christ himself, or we get to be the arms of Jesus as we love other people. Amen? In verse 18, it says that God has put each of us just where he wants us. Right? So as we look at this picture of a body, we see many, many, many faces blended together. From this distance, you probably can't see those faces. It's a mosaic of people. And we might be able to say, oh, well, here's the hands of Gage, who is a hard worker, who uh, loves to do projects to bless people. Here is the mouth that, of Hannah, who speaks and, uh, life into people and who sings rejoicing and praising God. And here's the mind of Rebecca and Ben, who are so analytical and are able to, to solve problems and to organize events and to uh, mobilize the body into, into doing amazing works for the Lord, like vacation Bible schools and blessing bag outreaches, all these things that if we weren't working together to do these things, they just wouldn't get done, right? Each of us has to bring our gifts, the gifts that come from the Holy Spirit, and, and work together as a body in order to both build up the body, to become the body of Christ, but also to move into that great commission that we have been called into, to go and make disciples, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them all that they have been commanded uh, through the Word of God. So I sometimes have a problem with comparing myself to others. This is a personal problem I have. I know it's a character flaw in me. I tend to compare myself to others I'll listen to a great sermon, and I'll be like, wow, that was really well said, that was really deep thought, you know, could I have done that? I'll start to compare myself to others, and that's always going to leave you feeling short, okay? But, 
if you realize that God has put you, or in this case, God has put me, in that specific spot that He needs you, and that there is nobody else on the earth living today that can fill that spot, that that body is incomplete without you being a part of it. That takes all pressure off. I don't need to be somebody else. I don't need to be the foot. I don't need to be the eye. I don't need to be the nose. I just need to be the part that God created me to be. And right now that part is a heart. Right? I, As a pastor, I, I, I'm flowing with love for, and compassion for people. And I want to motivate others. I want to pump the blood into the body to keep it moving, to keep it loving. And that's what God created me to be. The way I do that is different than the way the other 22 pastors in this town do that. We might have some similarities because we've been given similar gifts. But they don't have to look alike. They don't have to sound alike. I don't have to dress alike. Okay? And that frees me from comparing myself to others and realizing that God has a point for me right here. God has given me grace for right here and right now. God has gifted me to do the things that we're doing right here and right now. Verse 26 says, hey, if one part of the body suffers, then the whole body suffers. Or if one part of the body is honored, then we should all be rejoicing because we are a part of the same body. And so we need to get into this practice of loving and respecting all parts of the body because it is our, it is our own body, right? We don't need to be envious of other people when they get promoted. We don't need to be jealous that someone gets to drive a nicer car than we do. We need to be excited that God is moving in the body of Christ and that we get to come along for the ride and we get to be helpers in this mission. All right, so now we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, commonly referred to as the love chapter. And this is a very famous chapter of weddings. We tend to associate this with Valentine's Day, you know, hearts, roses, cupids, shooting arrows, and we get these twitter-pated feelings about how love, and you know, warm and, and gushy and lovey, uh, you know, love is to be loved, to have love, and it says amazing things in it like this, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Wow, those are big words to live up to. But guess what? I'm going to tell you something. Yes, this is an accurate description of what love looks like, but it's not talking about romantic love. It's not talking about the love that's reserved between a husband and a wife. It's not saying, oh, in 50 years, you know, we're hopeful that this couple is still going to be loving each other the way that they are today on on the platform as they're getting married. No, this is talking about loving each other when it's hard. It's talking about the body of Christ, specifically the local church in Corinth or in our church, loving each other when we rub each other the wrong way, when we annoy each other, when your tendencies don't agree with my desires, right? And so we need to reinterpret this scripture to ask ourselves, can I love this guy? Especially if you got married to this guy, and he was gruff. And every towel he touched became dirty. And he left the cap off the toothpaste again. Uh, all of these things that are insignificant in the long run, but yet wear away at our patience and wear away at our fabric or our emotions that we would call love. How about this guy? I'm willing to bet he's got a rap sheet. It is not normal for us to want to reach out and love someone like this. Am I right? And yet, God says that I'm giving you my love, my agape love, my unconditional love, so that you can love others in the same way. So get used to it. What about this guy who comes up to your car window and he's just asking for a little help? Maybe he stinks, maybe he's talking to himself. He is putting you out of your comfort zone. How do we respond to this guy? Do we respond to him in love? I sure hope so. God sent Jesus to die for this man. Just like he sent Jesus to die for you. Maybe he already has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We can still ask, Hey brother, do you need any prayer? Can I pray with you right now? All right? We can still extend the same love that Jesus would 
Jesus was constantly helping the poor and the sick and the hungry. In Matthew 25, he says, When you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. Love this person. This does not look like the rosy colored hearts we had earlier. This is real life in your face. Love is gritty. Do it anyway. What about this perfect Christian couple with the smile that just lights up and the white pearly teeth? And when I look at this picture, I look at this guy's biceps and he's got the vein coming down and the triceps popping out. And I start to think, wow, how did he do that and have this perfect family? And they don't have a care in the world. Obviously, this is a false impression because that's not reality. Everybody has cares in this world. Right? Jesus says you'll have plenty of troubles in this world, especially if you choose to follow him. Persecution will follow the decision to follow Jesus. Expect to be challenged by those on this earth and by demonic forces. There is an enemy against your soul, and all of us have challenges. None of us are as perfect as this picture makes it look. But yet, when we come into a a church setting, or when we scroll through Facebook and we see pictures like this, we might actually start to feel a little bit either of, of jealous or envy, or of questioning, or of judgmental uh, thoughts. No, cast those out. As it says in 2 Corinthians, take every thought captive, okay? Make it a slave to Jesus Christ. Throw them out the window and just say, Lord, bless this family. And Linus understood, as he says here in this comic, I love mankind. It's people that I can't stand. <laughs> and we can understand this. We relate to this. But God implores us through His love and through the sacrifice of Jesus. Love is a decision more than it is a feeling. Love anyway. Forgive anyway. Look past those faults anyway. How many times? Seven times? Seventy-seven times is what Jesus said. Do it anyway, because that's what God did for you. So carrying on, 1 Corinthians 13, the, the, this is like the, the best definition of this word agape, the Greek word that we see in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 for love is agape, which means the unconditional, self-sacrificing love that it comes from the Father, we, you and I, are not able to love with agape love if we are not connected to the Father. 1 John 4 eight says that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So without God there is no love, or let me turn that around, all love comes from God. It flows from God's character, His nature. He cannot choose to do anything else other than to love because that is His very nature. And that love flows to us, and we are challenged to share that same agape love with everybody in the world, but especially those in our, in our Christian community. It breaks God's heart when His own body can't work together and function with this all-empowering love that He gives us. Put yourself aside and love them anyway. Love must be our motivation and our method. Okay? Uh, verse 1 says, Don't be a noisy gong. Don't be that child who's just making a bunch of noise and getting on everybody's nerves. And maybe they're, just, they're making all the noise they can because they want to be heard. But they don't actually have anything real to say. They don't actually have any uh, love to give. It's self-focused. It's attention-getting. It's me, 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 me. Okay? Instead... We want to be sharing the word, the gospel, in love, with love, and through love. We need to be showing God's love as well as saying God's love. We're not trying to call attention to ourselves. We're trying to give glory to God and have people recognize that what God has for them is so much better than what the world has for them. The Pharisees asked Jesus. They were actually trying to trap him. They, they said, we're going to ask him what the most important commandment is. And if he gives us any answer at all, well, we can throw it at it because all the commandments are important. And God and Jesus said, let me sum it up this way. The first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And that came directly out of Deuteronomy. They couldn't argue with that. And then he said, the second commandment is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. And guess what? That also comes out of the Old Testament. 
That's the summary of the second half of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus says, and this sums up the law and the prophets. He says that also in Matthew 7, 12. But basically, if you are loving God and loving your neighbor, you are fulfilling all of the law. It's all about love. Don't complicate it. Don't mess it up. Don't make it about ritual, ceremony, religion, yourself. Make it about God. Make it about others. And you're on the right path. And here are some just quick litmus tests that you can use to determine if you're actually loving with agape love, as it describes here in 13. Verse 4 says, Are you able to rejoice for the success of others? When other people get that promotion that you've been working for and wanting, are you happy for them? If you're not, then you're not truly loving them. Do, verse 5 says, Do you keep records of wrongs? This is a tough one. Some, sometimes we like to hold long grudges. But this says that we need to forgive and forget. We can grow from those experiences. We can learn and be better prepared to protect ourselves, whatever the case may be. But we can't hold that against them. We need to give them grace. We need to give them more chances. We don't need to be reminding our spouse of a mistake they made two years ago. It's not relevant to today. Okay? We need to love and choose to love and forget the past. All right, before we conclude here, I just want to give you a quick image to take with you because love is kind of amorphous, you know, kind of like you can't really get a, a handle on it. It doesn't, you know, it's not a concrete thing. It's not a, a specific, like, do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't, you know, you can, it's not a set of rules to follow. Love is hard to, to describe, which is why we've had thousands of years of poets and books and movies that are built on this concept of love. I want to give you an illustration before we leave here to help you wrap your mind around 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. 1 Corinthians 12, as you recall, is about the gifts of the Spirit and the body of Christ. That the Holy Spirit gives us gifts and He gives us uh, different members of the body, apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, helpers, other people, who are gifted in certain ways. 1 Corinthians 13, being about the love that we need to have for one another that holds that body together. And 1 Corinthians 14, being about worshiping together. And so, the love, the agape that we talked about is kind of like the creamy center. This is what you really want to get to. This is what you want to give to people. When you tell people how great Oreos are, you aren't saying, hey, this, this cookie wafer... Thing is so yummy you gotta have it. No, you're saying you probably want to buy the double stuff uh, because the creamy stuff is, is really good. But you can't just give them the creamy part alone. It would fall apart. It would get all over their hands. It's a blob. Instead, you need to have the cookie as the delivery mechanism. The cookie is the gifts of the Spirit. The cookie is the, the working together of the body through ministries, processes, systems, the things of the church that enable you to deliver that creamy love to the people around you. Okay, In the same way, let's work together. Let's allow agape to bind us together. And let's be of the business of sharing all of this goodness with other people. Okay, We have been given the best creamy feeling that we could ever want, Jesus Christ, living in our hearts, taking our sins and providing us eternal life. Love beyond imagine. There is nothing that you can do that will cause God to love you more. There is nothing that you can do that will cause God to love you less. God loves because God is love and He has shared that with you and He wants you to share that with others. Our memory verse today is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Very famous verse. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So write down that verse. Read the second half of Corinthians 12 and all of Corinthians 13. And then pray about how you need to be more loving, more like God. How you need to display that agape love to other people, how you need to make a decision to love others and not just 
when it's in your comfort zone, when you feel like it. And of course, pray for one another. So now let me say a word of blessing over you, because I want to remind you that God loves you. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Lord, I pray that your love would grow. God, I pray that your love would not just become a word or a feeling, but it would become implanted so deeply in our heart and that it would grow out of that place into our thought life, into our actions, into our daily attitudes, into loving other people, love to overflowing, God. I pray for your spiritual baptism, that it would fall, God, that people would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and by doing so, they would have an uncontrollable, unconditional, self-sacrificing love that just draws you to them and ultimately to you, Father. Lord, that we would be more Christ-like, little Christians, little Christ, that people would come to know your nature, which is love. God, you are love. And you chose to share that with us, and you chose to go after us when we put that back in your face, when we sinned against you. You made it possible that we can be with you again. And if today is your day that you need to receive that love and make a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to recognize this, the gift that He has given you, then I pray that you would say these words, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me, to take my sins. Thank you for loving me even when I was unlovable. Thank you for loving me even when I hated you, God, when I was far from you. And now, God, help me to love others in the same way. Help me to show them that Jesus died for them too. Thank you, Lord. Amen.